Well, thank you very much. Um, and wonderful to have it from you, Ron. So thank you so much. And also, uh, may I also thank uh, the committee on the Brudner Award for uh, selecting me. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> I sort of feel I'm going to become like uh, you know, an Oscar Awards and break down and cry and so on. But I really am incredibly honored um, and grateful. And, uh, uh, and, you know, everyone's been so kind, everyone's been so efficient, and it's just such a great honor to uh, be here at all. Okay, well, this talk uh, is about um, the idea of an, an association of sissiness and music in Western culture generally, but also uh, perhaps especially within American culture, uh, and the way that that represents itself uh, in a couple of important films, films that have always been seen as uh, key moments, really, in the history of uh, gay representation, Rope and Tea and Sympathy, two films that are doing everything they can, in a way, consciously, to deny the fact that they have anything at all to do with homosexuality. In fact, when I showed Rope at, uh, in the 1977 season that uh, Ron mentioned in London, uh, several people I heard coming out said, why on earth was that shown? It had nothing to do with being homosexual. Uh, so, I mean, it was only one of the many insulting things I overheard. But uh, so, so both films, in a way, are consciously saying, well, of course, this is not really anything to do with homosexuality. Don't imagine that it is, even though everyone knew that's what it was. But in, in the course of that, the music has an interesting function because the music is partly a way of, in fact, declaring, or not declaring, but suggesting, connoting a, a sense of um, a gay presence in the film, that somehow these characters, or the main characters, are to be seen as gay. So on the one hand, it does seem the, mu the music is a way of, as it were, bringing back gayness, and even that dreaded thing, gay sensibility, which I think we're not supposed to talk about anymore, but we used to talk about it one time. Uh, it's a way of bringing back gay sensibility in films that are trying to deny that they are anything to do with homosexuality. But I think the films at the same time also suggest the, the vulnerability, the precariousness of that gay sensibility, the way that it's, it's, it's not really affirmed in the way that gay liberation would, of course, be calling for um, only 10 or 20 years later. So in a way, it al they also reveal the precariousness of this expression of gay sensibility, but also the sense of disturbance, that there's something very insecure and unstable about this uh, presence of gay sensibility that's actually disturbing for the film as a whole. So what I'm suggesting is a historical a connection of sissiness and music. This is represented in the films in a way that allows the films, in a way, to speak about homosexuality, whilst they're trying to deny it, and but also to suggest the precariousness and troubling quality of that gay sensibility. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about... Oh, I, don't, I seem to have managed to go to that slide immediately. Uh, I'm just going to say something a little bit more about the idea of music and the feminine, and then say something even shorter about gay men and the feminine, before turning to talk about the way rope and tea and sympathy uh, uh, deal with those. Okay, so first of all, to deal with the question of uh, music and the feminine. And I think it's true to say that there is a very long association in relation, and it's important to put in this qualification, in relation to white what, and what we now call classical music. So it's, I'm very much when I talk about music, I'm talking about white, white traditions of music. And there's a whole interesting, I think, history to be written about the, the sense, often within the, the white imagination, of the virility of black music, and, and, or indeed of certain kinds of folk music, white folk music as well, and the, and the need for that virility to kind of rescue the anemic quality of white classical music. So there's a whole uh, thing to be said there about the, uh, the uh, racial, in inverted commas, I uh, hate, hate when people do that, actually. But anyway, about, about, the, about the ethnic character, uh, or the colour, one might say, of different kinds of music. But I'm, that bracket that out because the, the films I'm dealing with are very much dealing with music within white classical music tradition. And there's a long tradition of thinking about that music as, in some sense, feminine, something that women like, something that's not quite masculine, and of that being a certain kind of source of anxiety which must be damped down, put in its place, and dealt with. 
And one way of registering that is through the phrase that was used a great deal, particularly in American cinema, but of course beyond the cinema, of this, this being long hair music. Now, it referred to, of course, that, that the men involved in this music had long hair. But, of course, we know that long hair, by the, certainly in the 20th century, long hair connotes the feminine. Uh, men have short hair, uh, women have long hair. So long hair music, the very term, uh, does suggest something about uh, the, the kind of... If the, uh, the, the, the somehow the un, un, sort of un, an unease about the gender of uh, white classical music. Uh, and the term was actually specifically used by Dor Sherry uh, in the negotiations around the making of Tea and Sympathy, when he said, oh, well, this, he said something like this, of course, the character isn't really homosexual, they all were saying that, it's just that he likes long hair music, and that is a, that's a bit iffy, and he's got to be rescued even from that. Um, and this is quoted in various places, but I'm happy to quote it from uh, the late George Custon, a great scholar who died very suddenly about, I think now about even as much as 10 years ago, but uh, a great loss, and I'm pleased to be just referencing his essay on the making of uh, Tea and Sympathy. So, um, long, that, that term comes in the film, but it's a very, you find it very widely used, uh, particularly in American culture in the 20th century, as a kind of unease about uh, classical music. Um, but this goes back much further into uh, the 19th century and a whole series of debates about the gendered quality of music, and particularly a famous essay by Robert Schumann, which is about the C major symphony of Schubert, in which he compares the symphony, which he does greatly admire, but he compares Schubert unfavorably in the end with Beethoven. He, he's kind of uneasy with Schubert. There's something kind of wishy and sentimental and emotional about Schubert. And what you, what, what's the best thing is the, is the virility and the masculinity of Beethoven. And this has been of great interest to musicologists in the last uh, 20 years or so, this, this discovering of these whole debates about the gendered quality of uh, classical music and a feeling that there's always a danger that classical music is somehow going to become too feminine, be overwhelmed by its femininity and not have the masculine virility of, um, uh, of Beethoven. And um, the, uh, one of the first people to really talk about this uh, was Susan McClary in a groundbreaking essay, but and there's also a whole book on Schubert uh, by Lawrence Kramer. Um, and I, uh, there are two aspects that, that McClary uh, particularly talks about. One is simply the idea of music being about emotions and the way that the Romantic movement introduced this emphasis upon being emotional um, and, that that, and that at the same time was also seen as the province of women. It was also seen as being about the body and there was a whole discourse in a way in which men should master and even transcend the body, whereas women are sort of condemned to being live, living entirely in the body. So there's a whole way in which a general emotionality is associated with music in these discourses about classical music and with femininity. But particularly importantly, I think, is a sense of mo emotional, particularly when you get to the late 19th century, of emotional instability. That it's not just that they have these passionate emotions, it's, that's perhaps okay. It's these vague emotions, these emotions that aren't quite resolved. What emotions are they? They're falling apart, they're, they're, they're fragmentary, uh, they're, they're confusing, they're ambiguous. It's that whole exploration of that area of music, which is what you get as the, as the 19th century proceeds and into the 20th century, that suggests emotional instability. And there's an interesting passage, uh, which, um, whose significance you'll see in a moment, in uh, McClary's discussion of Schubert, where she's talking about actually his Eighth Symphony, but she's, she's, she puts forward the argument that, that, that the whole organization does not enact the more standard model in which a self strives to define identity through consolidation of ego boundaries. That's, as it were, the masculine uh, uh, goal of uh, classical music, the Beethovenian ideal. In a Beethovenian world, that would seem vulnerable, would be a source of identity. The tonal identity would not be safely anchored. That sense of what, what, to, what harmony are we in now? Where, which key are we in now? It keeps shifting. That would be a source of anxiety, she, she suggests, in um, sort of the Beethoven, the masculine music, 
whereas in the feminine music, it's all, uh, it's kind of, it's, it's acceptable as part of the kind of, just uh, the range of kinds of emotions that can be had, the ambiguities, the subtleties, and so on. Um, and uh, she suggests that there's often a need to introduce to kind of clamp down on, in, in Beethoven on those un unstable emotions, which are nonetheless perhaps more accepted within a, poet, a, a composer like Schubert. Now, of course, a lot of the interest in this comes from the fact that Schubert may well himself have been gay. I mean, it's, there's still much debate about it, but there is a lot of... It, this certainly sprang from an interest in an assumption that he was not, as it were, gender normative. I think if you even look at the um, pictures, uh, I think I put them... Let me just go back to the pictures. That you've got here, this kind of, uh, the man with his pencil in his hand, looking very firm and so on. And then we have Schubert's all sort of lying back. And so <laughs> so, so, so even, even, even in the depiction there, you get that sense. And people have been very interested in that. And then also in some evidence to suggest that Schubert was perhaps himself gay. So, um, so the other thing just to say then is about gay minority men and femininity. Because, and I almost don't need to say more than that, except to say that that has been for at least 200 years, you know, an, an assumption that somehow if men are not real men, then they may be something worse, i.e. they may be queers. Uh, and an anxiety, and in fact, the, the production code never quite named homosexuality, the production code in, um, new, in uh, Hollywood, Everything was conveyed through, well, we mustn't have men being effeminate because, you know, this may suggest perverse sexuality. Well, we all know what perverse sexuality they had in mind. So what I'm putting together here is a long tradition of any way associating music and, and certain kinds of music and this kind of unresolved, emotionally ambiguous music, putting that together with femininity and then also putting that together with the association of gay men with femininity. But just one other thing, which is almost a bit of uh, more like gossip, but, but people who in America thought, oh, classical music, isn't that all a bit iffy on the sort of, you know, aren't they all a bit sort of queer? Actually, in a way, they had a reason to think that. Just think of some of the most famous uh, composers in, Ameri in American history, and you do, and that, I mean, apart from Charles Ives, you've got practically all the sort of major figures. You've also got people I haven't put there, like Virgil Thompson and Mark Blitzstein and, of course, the lyricist Lorenz Hart. So it's, it, there's a way in which perhaps people had a reason to think there might be a problem, there might be a problem of sissiness in relation to music. Now, what I want to do now, then, is to think about that in relation to the two films uh, listed in the title. So, first of all, Rope, made in 1948. Rope is based upon um, the famous murder uh, by uh, Leopold and Loeb of a young boy uh, in 1928, um, and there is some actually discussion. I mean, it's always generally assumed that they were gay, um, but there's some suggestion that perhaps only one of them was and the other was manipulating that or whatever. But still, it, the, the basic wide assumption has always been that they are gay, and it's been a source of uh, constant fascination. So there is, for instance, um, the original play by Patrick Hamilton, which is what the um, film is based on, which was uh, made in... Uh, this is where I have to... 1929, written in 1929. There is a film, the film Compulsion, made in 1959, uh, which was, is actually partly a, a polemic against uh, capital punishment. Um, there is the film Swoon, which a previous Brudner Award winner, uh, Ruby Rich, uh, was one of the films that she named as part of this new uh, movement called, known as now as New Queer Cinema. And there was recently also a musical, uh, but actually a very rather good musical, uh, called Thrill Me, uh, made in 2003. So we have a situation of a story that's very widely assumed to be gay, both in the news coverage of the time, but also in every version uh, made since. And yet, which in the film, there's uh, certainly no direct mention of that, and you have to kind of read between the lines and so on. In the film, uh, the two killers become Philip and Brandon, um, and Philip and Brandon are in fact played by Farley Granger and John Dahl, both of whom were gay. Um, and the script was by Arthur Lawrence, who during the year or so that Rope was being prepared was in fact having an affair with Farley Granger. So there are quite a lot of people sort of involved in it who in some way or other were gay, and yet still the idea of the f was that the music, that the film uh, should, not, should be thought to be not really gay. Um, 
But interestingly, then, is the use of music. Now, there is no uh, background music. All the music is music that's being played in the scene of the film, and the whole film takes place at a party immediately after the killing of uh, a young man by, the, by um, Philip and Brandon. And, and they've put, they have put the body in a chest, and they're now sort of, you know, sort of rather defiantly uh, having this party around the body and the chest. So the only music is, there are only two sources of music, and one is a piece of music by Francis, Francis I don't know I'm trying to say it in French, Francis Poulenc, um, and Francis Poulenc is, uh, was a uh, well-known to be gay composer. Um, and apart from uh, that picture, I just thought it was nice to see this picture of him with Jean Cocteau, um, uh, who one of the most, I suppose, declared uh, out sort of gay people uh, in uh, 20th century, uh, certainly 20th century French history. The piece of music that is involved is a piece of music called Mouvement Perpetuel, Perpetual Movement. And I want to, begin, I want to just now then play you, let me just find the right thing, uh, the, uh, this version, in, the, in fact in the version as played by Poulenc himself. Okay, so that's and it goes on a bit, uh, and I just want to play. I'll play it again, but this time I'm going to put up as well a, an analysis of it in a, an article by Scott Paulin. Let me just find it. And I think what's interesting about this analysis is the echoes of the Susan McClary account of the analysis of the Schubert. The sense this is a piece of music that keeps shifting key, keeps shifting direction, despite being perpetual movement, despite rolling along, fluidly rolling along, it's still nonetheless very unresolved, very ambiguous, ironic, charming, and yet somehow not quite in a definite key in the way that might be, uh, rec that might be thought to be sort of proper in a piece of music. Okay. And there's also another interesting, apart from the article which you've just seen, the, the Scott Paulin article, there's also another interesting article by uh, Gary Thomas about the use of uh, this piece of music uh, in this film. Okay. So now I want to then now look at an, uh, the use of the music in the film itself. And I want to take, first of all, the first time we hear it, the murder's been committed, the body is in by strangling, uh, and the body is hidden in the chest, and the party has begun. And a friend called Mrs. Atwater claims to be able to read, uh, read palms. Uh, and this is the sequence that begins with her reading palms. Um, and I think perhaps I don't need to say anything more than that. I'll make some comments on it afterwards. So let's have a look at this uh, sequence. May I see your hand? You don't remember the hour of your birth by any chance? No. Good finger, strong, artistic. What about the concert? Philip, the Farley Grinch, is of course a pianist. These hands will bring you great fame. Well, I can see them. I'm a very fortunate man today. I'm on hand for the grand opening. What? Of your collection, so to speak. Oh, yes, of course. Are you going oh, to play? I, I How be. lovely. Your wife sends her love. David wasn't there? No, he'll probably be here in a minute, though. Okay, to go back to the PowerPoint for a moment. Well, I think there are two things that I particularly want to emphasize. Of course, there is the irony. And the irony is uh, that what she's saying, of course, you are going to be famous for your hands. And of course, he's going to be famous because his hands were used to strangle someone. But she, he thinks, well, she means he's going to be famous for playing. So it's interesting that the, 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 um, 
do you might call the weapons of murder are also the means of, of producing this uh, pretty little game piece of music. So we've got a kind of a sense of which that, the, that, that there's a, a link almost between the kind of anxiety uh, that uh, Philip feels, because he's much more anxious about the whole thing, um, that his anxiety is being linked at the same time to his being able to play the piano. But nonetheless, he goes down and plays it actually slightly slower than the version I played you, which was Poulenc himself, but he plays it slower, but still absolutely confidently and so on. And then enter Rupert, who is uh, the mentor of the characters, and the moment Rupert comes in, he stops the playing. So Rupert, who in the play is a much more, uh, himself seems to be a gay character, here he's, he represents absolutely the kind of straight stopping of this charming little tune being played. So whereas, uh, you know, and so what we've got so far is the music's function is to kind of be an expression, an indi completely indirect expression of, an am of, a, of a tonally ambiguous uh, but charming and ironic piece of music, which is suddenly brought to an end uh, by the ar arrival of the very much author male authority figure. Okay, well, I'll move on then to uh, a second extract. Uh, and this is a little bit later, um, and it starts with a conversation between the woman who is um, helping them put out the meal, uh, Mrs. Wilson. Uh, and she is discussing with Rupert, the James Stewart character, uh, the fact that the two boys seem to be very much on edge and so on. And I've started it here because there's another piece of music that is actually being used. And this is a piece of music, but a play, it's actually a song called Four Leaf Clover, which is kind of the absolute most kind of, oh, isn't life wonderful? I'm looking over a four leaf clover. It's absolutely kind of no problems, everything's wonderful and so on but played by this rather strange quartet, or trio, and we're putting the extra man, uh, this strange trio of uh, men in this strange harmony. And then we see this very rather odd little burbling little sort of um, uh, electric organ music that you hear in the background. So although the music in one way, is, it's, it absolutely represents normality, it's cheerful, it's, it's associated, particularly with the heterosexual couple that's already beginning to form uh, within the film, uh, and it's being put on deliberately in order to foster their relationship. Nonetheless, there's also something kind of odd about it, and I think it was quite good to have that in the background. But then uh, we uh, move to... Uh, let to find my own notes. Yeah. We, we then move to uh, a, a, a sequence between, once again, Philip and the character of Rupert. And at one point, I just need to mention, explain one thing before s suggesting things that are interesting about this sequence, is that there is reference to strangling a chicken. Um, earlier in the film, uh, we've been told about um, the fact that uh, Philip was supposed to strangle a chicken at Brandon's mother's house. Uh, and he made a mess of it. He wasn't really up to strangling a chicken. And obviously, it's a coded way of saying, Philip's a bit of a loose cannon here. He's not reliable. He's not even all that good at killing people, not even all that good at strangling chickens. So we have heard this remark. You might, it's kind of, it just, it will surprise, it would surprise you to hear it in the film if you didn't know why it was being mentioned. However, I think what's interesting about this sequence is, first of all, you've got this sense of uh, this normal music that's then being replaced by this one I'm suggesting is this sort of gay music uh, in the Poulenc. But also, most interestingly, is the way the music itself gets stopped and then starts again. It gets broken up. It, 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 um, the playing loses its way. So this charming piece of music that is itself somewhat uh, un, 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 in, in emotional terms, not that definite, becomes more broken up, more challenged, as Rupert, the character of Rupert, effectively challenges it, inclu including calling it that little tune. You like that little tune, don't you? This rather patronizing way he talks about the music. So there's almost like a battle going on between the, get, the charming, ironic, gay voice of the music and the inquiring, re rationalistic, patriarchal voice of uh, the uh, Rupert character. And that's then reinforced at a certain point when Rupert puts on a metronome. And so we have the contrast between the metronome, which is absolute regular movement, absolute uh, in insistence like march rhythm, running counter to the uh, movement 
perpetuelle of the, uh, of the Poulenc that, uh, that Philip is trying to play and keeps losing his way with it. And I think what's really interesting about that is not only uh, a contrast of the regular, they are both, in fact, perpetual movement. But one is a notion of perpetual movement as much more industrial, much more based upon an, an imposed order uh, fitting into a certain kind of mathematical definiteness. Whereas the perpetual movement of the Poulenc relates much more actually to thoughts, thinking about time and tempo uh, in, the, in the period in France, where yes, it's perpetual, but it's also, it, it, it keeps changing speed, it keeps changing rhythm, but it's much more broken up now. But even the, but the piece of music itself is a fluid sense of perpetual motion as opposed to an industrial one. So what we've got set here against is the, the metronome imposing one kind of uh, uh, rhythm and one kind of time, and the music trying to be a different kind of time, but then constantly breaking down in the face of this um, pa patriarchal assault. So let's um, look at that extract. Why did you serve from here, anyway? It wasn't my idea. I had everything laid out in the dining room, and it was just beautiful. Is she still harping on her table and how awkward it is to serve from this? But it's really much more convenient, you know. Because this way, people don't have to go all the way into the dining room to get their food and come all the way back here to eat. Hmm. Seems to me they've gone all the way in there now for their dessert and coffee. Mrs. Wilson, please serve the guests. Don't lecture them. We did get up on the wrong side of the bed, didn't we? I'm in quite an embarrassing position. How do you mean? Well, I seem to be the only one having a good time. You and Mrs. Atwater. What's going on, Philip? Would you mind turning that off? I'm sorry. I, I don't like to play with light in my eyes. The siren is, you by know, the way, Philip, on the film, and that's throughout the film, that sense of the siren being constantly coming to get the boy. Did you ask I think that question? siren might yes, really Philip, be out I there. Asked you a question. Well, what was it? I asked you what is going on here. A party? Yes, but a rather peculiar party. What's it all about, Philip? What's what all about? Now stop playing crime and punishment, Rupert. If you want to know something, come out with it. Otherwise, oh, no, temper, temper. Now, don't stop. I'd like a drink. Oh, wait, I'll get it for you. I'll keep playing. What would you like, scotch? No, brandy. You're very fond of that little tune, aren't you? You know, Philip, I wish I could come straight out with what I want to know. Unfortunately, I don't know anything. I merely suspect. I said that I, I heard you. That's all right. Thank you. You use this? Sometimes. I thought only beginners did. I must say. All right. I'll ask you. What do you suspect? Oh, I've forgotten. Where's David, Philip? I don't know. Why? Brandon knows. Does he? Doesn't he? Not that I know. Oh, come now. I don't. Why don't you ask Brandon? I have. But he's too busy maneuvering the other two points of the triangle. What for, Philip? Just what is Brandon trying to do with Janet and Kenneth? <laughs> what, what are you laughing at? Nothing. What is... What, um, what am I, so far off the track? There's nothing going on at all, Rupert. You're, uh, more than usually allergic to the truth tonight, Philip. That's the second time you haven't told me. 
thanks. When was the first? When you said you'd never strangle a chicken. You're confused. Brandon dreamt that up. For the sake of a very unfunny joke. No, he didn't. No, he didn't, Philip. And if you'll think back very carefully, you'll realize that I know he didn't. About a year ago, I was up the farm, you remember? One morning, I saw you display your handiwork. You're quite a good chicken strangler, as I recall. Well, I, I just meant that Brandon's story wasn't true. I, I didn't mean I hadn't killed any chickens. That's what you said. Well, I, I didn't think it was a suitable topic of conversation while we were eating. You could have said that. All right, I didn't. We're not eating now, Philip. What did you lie to me for? Because I don't like to talk about... About what? Strangling I can't chicken. play with that thing. I want you to have it very much. It's extremely generous of you, Brandon. I Okay, so what I've been trying to say, at the end, at the end of the film, uh, they are, of course, found out by Rupert and the police are on their way, and we have uh, an attempt to pick out the tune, but it's completely drowned by, for the first time, this huge orchestra coming in and affirming that, indeed, this pretty little tune is not going to be allowed to be the tune uh, that, that survives right through to the end of the film. So what I've been trying to suggest in, this ca in the case of this film uh, is that the... Let me just refer back. To, uh, is that this piece of music, which has in many ways, uh, uh, which, is in, which, it, which belongs to a whole tradition of a piece of music that's tonally ambiguous and relates to a sense of emotional uncertainty, but an ease with emotional uncertainty, which relates to an idea also of charm and irony. All of that is being used in the film partly as, a, as a, way, it's a way for Philip to affirm himself and to keep, uh, keep calm in the face of this terrible thing that they've done, but it's in competition with uh, this kind of voice of authority coming from James Stewart, and in the end it's defeated uh, by um, both musically but also by the actions of the James Stewart character, so suggesting the disturbance and the vulnerability of this kind of music. Well, I want to turn from that then to Tea and Sympathy, which was made in 1956. And Tea and Sympathy was based on a play that was originally produced in 1953. You see also see here the uh, pulp, pulp fiction version. I say that it actually is the play script inside, but it was, it was resold at the time of the making of the film uh, as if it, you were going to get a novel, but it's actually the play inside. So it was actually a very well-known property, uh, and the play is, again, pretty clearly uh, about homosexuality. And in fact, uh, in, during the negotiations, Elia Kazan, who had directed the original production and was in negotiation about MGM making the film version, was absolutely unequivocal. The whole thing is about homosexuality. But in the course of uh, a long, uh, of long negotiations, which have been uh, looked at in both these uh, uh, things I've put up here, uh, um, that the homosexuality was increasingly denied, uh, not talked about, thought about merely in terms of someone who's missing his mother, someone who likes long hair music, someone who likes folk music, and so on. Complete, uh, an attempt to completely, utterly uh, go against the idea that the whole thing is about homosexuality, though that's what everyone knew was the case. Um, now, in a very interesting article by David Gerstner, he suggests that um, that repression of any explicit reference to um, homosexuality is, is, as it were, comes back in the form of the taste of the film. That the film, particularly the visual taste of the film, is a, is a, is a, is a sort of good taste in a certain kind of uh, interior decoration kind of tradition of gay men, and not, and not of course, by no and not by coincidence, uh, the director of the film is Vincent Minnelli, of course, who is in, in a way a fascinating case because he's is kind of was he or wasn't he? Uh, well, probably yes, but we weren't supposed to know. So he's almost he's in the same neck of the woods uh, as these films themselves. But Gerson's argument, I think, is very interesting in suggesting that the as it were the gayness is, as it were, put onto the excessive good taste and, uh, de uh, and be beautiful careful uh, decoration and clothing and flowers and so on uh, that, that run throughout the whole film. Now, what I want to suggest is that taking on, going on from uh, David Gerstner's argument is that you could say the same thing about the music as well, that the music is, again, where we are going to get some of this concern with uh, gay sensibility. Now, the music is based upon a piece of music 
uh, by uh, Maurice Ravel. Um, and uh, this is called Pavan for a Dead Inf Infanta, uh, written in 1899. Um, now Ravel, again, is an interesting figure, much less, uh, very much a dandy, uh, and much, uh, much speculation about uh, his sexuality. Certainly he wasn't in any conventional sense heterosexual, uh, though he was much less known to be uh, think of himself as gay than a Poulenc that we dealt with before. But the whole question of his, his, his gay identity and his gay association has been wonderfully uh, written about by uh, Lloyd Weitzel in uh, this article, Ravel's Way, in a collection that he and Fo Sophie Fuller put together. Now, not only um, do I want to, not only then does it come with certain connotations of historically, you know, that in a way, Ravel is part of this kind of sissy, uh, chromatically ambiguous, probably homosexual musical culture. But interestingly, uh, and I only discovered this on the train between uh, Boston and New Haven yesterday, um, it was dedicated to Winneretta Singer. And Winneretta Singer married, uh, her second marriage was to the very much older Prince de Polignac, who was gay and a composer. So there's quite interesting sort of background associations, uh, which may or may not, of course, have been fully known. But it comes out of a certain kind of world. Now, so what I want to do now is to play you, first of all, the Pavan uh, for a Dead Infanta, um, just to give you um, a familiarity. Then I'm going to pl play the opening of the film. And although, of course, it isn't exactly the same tune, but I think the, the long arching opening uh, uh, melodic phrase and then the harmonics are very close to each other, though you do also get the sort of MGM big orchestra harmonics as well in the case of the opening sequence of Tea and Sympathy. Anyway, let's just listen to the Ravel. Okay, and now we'll look at the um, and listen to the opening of uh, Tea and Sympathy. Okay, so that forms the basis of the um, music background, the background music in the film. Uh, and it's used uh, on and off throughout the film. And I want to show you just two sequences. One is the first, is the, a sequence near the beginning when the main character, Tom, uh, goes to, um, uh, back to his old school reunion. Um, and it, the whole film is a flashback to him remembering how he was teased because he was a sissy boy, because he was a, like long-haired music. Um, and the story is a well-known story. The story is of him bef being befriended by the uh, wife of the housemaster where he lives. And she, in order to rescue him uh, from his uh, gender uncertainty and no doubt worse, uh, has, has sex with him. Um, and that, uh, we're supposed to think, has cured him. Uh, it's uh, in the film, we really are supposed to think that. In the play, it's fairly clear that it was very kind of her, but it didn't really take. Um, but anyway, um, this, is, this is sequence. And what's interesting about this sequence, I think, is that we start with, uh, again, with this kind of Ravelian uh, piece of music, which is the main th music of the film. Um, and it's very much, um, sorry, let me just find my own notes to remind myself what I'm supposed to be saying. 
uh, it's very much, uh, we, we, get, we, get, we, we get that both at the beginning of the sequence and then towards the end of the sequence. So it, this is the kind of slightly melancholy, slightly emotionally insecure, emotionally uncertain kind of emotion that we're getting at the time. But then that gives way to music that is uh, the college song. So again, we've got like a contest between the gay sensibility music, if you like, and the straight college song music. And then, towards the end, we also hear another piece of music. And this is actually the song Plaisir d'Amour, the, the, the Joys of Love, uh, which is, was written in 1780, so it's a very old song. But I think what's interesting about it is that it was made, uh, it was used in the film The Heiress, made in 1949, which one might say is a somewhat overdetermined gay text, even though the director was William Wyler, who is, I think, perhaps not a particularly gay director. But nonetheless, based on a text by Henry James, music by Aaron Copeland, starring Montgomery Clift, and also Miriam Hopkins. Uh, so really quite a lot of gay sensibility going into this. So at the end of the film, uh, at the end of the sequence, we also get that piece of music. Now what's interesting about that piece of music is not only, uh, not so much that kind of gossipy links with the heiress, but this again is, is a song of sensibility from, from the, right in the Romantic era, uh, it's, a it's a melancholy song, but also it has, because it's played on the guitar, it has the character of a folk song. And there's a very curious moment in the film when the father of the boy, Tom, uh, who is the main character, Tom's father says, it's so embarrassing to have a son who's, who tells you what he wants to be when he grows up. And you think he's going to say, you know, an interior decorator or a hairdresser or something. He wants to be a folk singer. So uh, there seems to have been some connotation of folk singing being not quite uh, a communal foe uh, at the time. So we've got in this sequence the kind of the, the contests of different kinds of music, all of which are around the kind of question of placing Tom in relation to a kind of normative idea of, of gender and sexuality. So let's have a look at this. Well, uh, I used to live here ten years ago. Do you think they'd mind if I went in? Oh, no, of course not. And one of the things that's interesting is that if you listen towards the end of hearing this college song, it begins to take on, in fact, the sort of Ravel harmonies and, and instrumentation. Okay, so um, in the course of the film, uh, just to move on to, yeah, sorry, let me just put 
Mr. Thorne. In the course of the film, uh, not only uh, is he taunted, he also um, tries to have sex with a local prostitute, but then uh, finds the whole thing disgusting and runs out, and then finally is seduced by the, De the Deborah Carr character. Now, music continues to be important, and not only music in this, uh, the association of this Ravel-type music it, with uh, Tom's story, but also as actually subject matter in the film. There's a very famous scene you see at the top here in the music room, um, and uh, this is famous, and it's used in the film of the celluloid closet, for instance. It's a scene in which this man, who's a friend of Tom's, tries to show him uh, how to walk like a man. It's sort of a... <laughs> it's, it's, a really, it's a wonderfully funny scene, uh, trying to say, well, the trouble is you walk, you walk in this springy way and you need to walk like this. Um, so that's why it's a famous scene. But it is, in fact, in the music room, and we have the, the reassuring, possibly, bust of Beethoven uh, in the middle there. But also, I think very interesting is the whole idea of listening to music. And it's bad enough to like classical music, but then to sit passively listening to it. And there's a whole history of the passivity of uh, response to music uh, that's also present, and also often playing sort of ro melancholy, romantic music. Um, so um, this, this is an important scene in the film. But also important is a moment in which the um, housemaster, who's a very macho type, uh, says to Tom, don't you think when I was a young man, I too would sit for hours in my, weeping in my room listening to music, but I repressed it, I became a real man. So that association of weeping uh, with um, uh, 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 an effeminacy with music is uh, again an important theme in the film. And at the end of the film, when uh, Tom, uh, we see Tom going back and knocking on the door of the housemaster, who's now his wife has left him, and what do we see? we see him sitting, listening to music, uh, rather affirming something that's been suggested throughout the film, that, of course, the housemaster himself uh, had the same problems uh, as did uh, Tom. Now, these problems are compensated for by what now, I suppose, looks like nothing but... Uh, it doesn't, doesn't really look like it's hiding its gayness at all. But these sequences uh, are meant to show um, that uh, in the, the housemaster's kind of affirmation of his masculinity. But obviously we may now tend to read that as, to, uh, as being so excessively affirmed as to suggest that he too has the same kinds of erotic feelings as Tom. So uh, at the end of the film, Tom uh, opens a letter that's been left for him from Deborah Carr. And I want to now just play you this sequence uh, to end with. Because uh, in this sequence, um, she talks about the fact that, you know, she's split up from her husband and that uh, the, book, the book that Tom wrote is not quite right. But I think what interest is, what's interesting is that at the beginning of this, when he, you, you hear her voice and uh, the music you hear is completely unmelodic. You don't know where, it doesn't know where it's going. It's, it's, it's completely... It's within, it, tonally, actually, it is quite Ravel, but nonetheless, it doesn't have any of the mo melodic sense. Then at a certain point, um, the, uh, the letter refers to the husband, and the film, having moved in on a camera movement, cuts to a shot of the husband, who is in the study just off the garden here, um, and then the camera moves back, and as the camera moves back, the Ravel theme comes in, which seems to be very clearly linking uh, the housekeeper and Tom as being part, really, of the same uh, emotionally unstable sensibility, but with a sense, perhaps, we may like to feel, anyway, that the repression, all that's, all that's done has left him weeping by the gramophone for the, for the house... The, um, the, uh, I can't think of the word, the man who runs the house where Tom lived, um, at, whereas perhaps Tom is much more reconciled. We're meant to think, he, we, in fact, we're told he's married and so on, but I think we can actually see it as much more someone who is comfortable uh, with his um, gay sensibility. So let's, uh, um, I mean, again, if, if, if we want to see it that way. So let's have a look at this last sequence from the film. Tom, dear... I have just read your book, your novel about your days in school, about us. It is a lovely book, tender and romantic and touching. And in it, I come out rather like a saint. But Tom, that isn't the whole picture, or even the true picture. 
You have romanticized the wrong we did and not looked at it clearly. At the end of the story, you say that the husband was far better off without his wife, and the wife went on to her own happy life. You're quite wrong, Tom. As you know, I couldn't go back to Belle after that afternoon with you and pretend that nothing had happened. And my not going back ruined his life. The 16th. I find that I sacrificed Bill and our marriage. He thought he knew what he wanted, to be left alone. Just as you thought you knew what you wanted, to kill yourself. Both of you, in a sense, were crying out to be saved from what you thought you wanted. I answered your cry. It was the easier one to answer. Okay. So what I've been trying to argue is that uh, in both these films, um, I've been trying to argue something about the way in which this music, in a way, represents something about the conditions of expressivity in a period in which you can't be openly uh, and direct about uh, lesbian or gay identity. And it both suggests the richness of the possibilities of indirection, uh, the kind of use of irony, the use of emotional exploration and uncertainty, um, the sense of uh, el elusiveness. So it both suggests the rich possibilities of this condition of cultural production in the kind of half-open closet. Um, it also suggests um, the uh, vulnerability of this form of expression, the way it can actually be squashed down much more clearly in rope uh, than in tea and sympathy, where in a way it does survive, albeit very tenuously. But it also suggests that perhaps there was something quite disturbing. I, don't know, I hate these sort of claims for transgressiveness in some very strong way, but there was just something um, disorienting, destabilizing about this emotionally uncertain, ambiguous, ironic music that actually produced a felt need to repress it. So we both have the richness of the tradition, its vulnerability, but also its potential for disturbance. And this seems to me an interesting, I hope, example of the aesthetics of uh, cultural, uh, queer cultural production, gay cultural production, under the condition of the closet. Thank you very much.